Okay, so on January 21st of 2017, the jazz drummer Mark Juliana played a gig at the Blue Whale in Los Angeles, California. And there's a clip from this gig that I am just absolutely fascinated by, where everything on the bandstand just seems to go to complete hell. The cymbals just kind of fall over into the audience in the middle of the drum solo. The keyboard just kind of falls randomly off of its keyboard stand. There clearly was something in the air on this gig. The music and the gear just kind of unravel before your eyes. The music in particular feels as unhinged as the cymbal felt. Several weeks later, in Stamford, Connecticut, another musical train wreck would happen, but one that I'm very thankful never made its way to YouTube. This is the story of the greatest musical train wreck I've ever been part of. 820 train to New Haven, Stanford will be next. Okay, so let's talk about wedding gigs. Yes, the music can be cheesy and the hours can be long, but the pay is good and the work is steady. Two things that don't often occur in the music industry. I've played probably upwards of, I'm gonna say, 100 weddings in the past couple of years, and I've seen a lot of stuff, both great things and terrible things. And probably my favorite glorious train wreck of a moment came when a bridesmaid came up to the band during a break and asked to sing, can You Feel the Love Tonight by Elton John as a dedication to the newlyweds. The band knew the song and we thought it would be a nice moment, so yeah, why not? Let's do it. Everything would run smoothly in our minds so long as the bridesmaid knew the song. <sighs> and uh, no, everything was not fine. We came back from the break and a crowd gathered for the big dedication. A hush fell across the entire reception of several hundred people. The pianist started playing the first opening chords to Can You Feel the Love Tonight, and as soon as the bridesmaids started singing, we knew we were in for an ordeal. So Ellen John's original version of Can You Feel the Love Tonight is in B flat major, but the version from Disney's The Lion King is in F major. To this day, I don't really know which version the bridesmaid was singing. I mean, we were doing it in B flat, but she didn't seem to notice. There clearly was a disconnect happening. So the pianist started doing that thing that rehearsal pianists have done since time immemorial. He started playing the melody in the right hand of the piano in a desperate bid to try and get the singer back on track. Now, unfortunately, I can't demonstrate that for you because the melody of Can You Feel the Love Tonight is copyrighted. But fortunately, there's another melody which sounds kind of similar. It would have sort of sounded like this. Unfortunately, this initial gambit to correct course failed, and the bridesmaids soldiered on in atonal ignorance. The drummer and I looked at each other and thought, well, maybe we should play quieter. Maybe the stage volume needs to be quieter so that she can hear herself better. But playing quieter didn't help. It just meant that we were even more exposed to the intense scrutiny of a couple hundred onlookers. When we got to the first chorus, Can You Feel the Love Tonight? One of the singers from our band started lightly singing the melody in the background to try and get the bridesmaid to match his pitch. But unfortunately, I think she took that as a cue to try and harmonize with our singer, which just ended so, so, so poorly. It's at about this point that normally we would just cut our losses and throw up the universal hand signal for God, please, let's end this and launch into something like, I don't know, Uptown Funk. It was at a wedding in Connecticut two years ago. White people love Uptown Funk. But the bridesmaid launched directly into verse two. She had a mission. She was going to sing, Can You Feel the Love Tonight? And we would be there, her unwilling passengers. I looked over at the drummer and he mouths, there's no way out. It was about halfway through the second verse where the bridesmaid settled into a key about a half step below where we were. And this got the wheels turning in my head. You see, on the car ride up, a couple of the members of the band had watched a video of a pianist chasing the key centers of a tone-deaf singer singing the Star Spangled Banner. Hmm. Could we, could we modulate our way out of this situation? Could we modulate down and catch her in her key? 
and do it at the beginning of the final chorus so it sounds like a big climactic moment. Is this the way that we save the day? I looked over at the guitarist and the pianist to see if we couldn't coordinate this scheme. But as the final chorus approached, the pianist was actually making the universal modulate up a half step signal, which made no sense. The singer was singing down a half step. And then I panicked. Can You Feel the Love Tonight is one of those songs that you just can never remember if there's a big climactic modulation in the final chorus. I mean, without checking, can you remember if Elton John modulates? Yeah, at that moment, neither could I. The final chorus of this tortured rendition of Can You Feel the Love Tonight is fast approaching and it's clear that something's going to happen. The guitarist, pianist, and I are going to go somewhere, but we just don't know where. Are we gonna go up? Are we gonna go down? Are we gonna stay the same? And then, <laughs> It hits. The guitarist, the pianist, myself, and the poor, poor bridesmaids start doing Can You Feel the Love Tonight in four keys at the same time. It was a quadratonal rendition of Elton John's vision of pop. It truly was the darkest timeline. Uh, now, it turns out that Elton John's version of the song doesn't modulate, but the version that's used in Disney's The Lion King does. It modulates unprepared from F major up a whole step to G major. This whole step modulation, by the way, is sometimes called the Disney modulation, which has a very particular feel to it that's kind of bright and airy. But the feeling of that kind of modulation does not compare to the supremely sour phenomenology of modulating to four keys at the same time. Holy crap. Honestly, it was so bad that it was funny. I had to suppress laughing because there was something so perfectly terrible about the moment that I had never experienced before. It was just the cherry on top of it all. It was just so beautifully cringy. Scrambling to put the sham back together, we self-corrected back to B-flat major and let the song finally die its sad, slow, terrible death. We had burned the song to the ground in front of this very attentive audience, and from the ashes, no phoenix would rise. There would just be rubble. The audience was treated to a live version of a Shreds video. And so we return to the scene of the crime, the Stanford Marriott Hotel, where two years ago, tragedy befell a helpless wedding band. But, you know, really wasn't that bad. Musically, don't get me wrong, it was god-awful, but it wasn't the first train wreck that the band had ever experienced, nor would it be the last. Honestly, it kind of comes with the territory. Anytime that you perform on a stage, be it on dance or theater or music, technical and logistical meltdowns could happen. And if a few minutes of cringe is the worst thing that happens in your job, honestly, it's a pretty sweet gig. It certainly helps to keep things in perspective. I have a friend who's a jazz bass player who quit playing jazz full-time to pursue a maritime career, piloting boats and things like that. And he said that the worst thing that happens in music is you look kind of stupid. When you make a mistake in music, nobody gets hurt, nobody dies. The only wrecks are metaphorical. I think about this sometimes, especially when I'm getting dark and inside my head, and when things around me aren't going well on the bandstand, or when I don't feel like I'm playing very well. It's easy to get wrapped up in something that you believe in and that you love, but it's important to learn how to let go. And I think it's an important experience for everybody out there who plays music to at least have one good train wreck. Because I think musical train wrecks are just great practice for the real train wrecks that might happen in your life, where the world really is falling apart around you, and you need to know how to let go and ride that energy and not break with it. Mark Juliana and crew certainly knew how to ride the wave during their musical train wreck, and magic seemed to happen. The date of the gig seems somewhat significant to me. January 21st, 2017, the date after Trump's inauguration. It's hard not to think that that contributed to the general vibe of the gig. At least in that corner of LA, it might have seemed like the world was falling apart. So train wrecks, if we're going to define them, are any time that the situation is completely outside of your control, and the only thing that you can control is your reaction to the situation. In this way, I think they are a great opportunity for practicing self-growth, and music in particular provides a safe space for practicing that kind of awareness. Remember, it's just music. In a musical train wreck, nobody gets hurt, everybody goes home. Now, the difference between Juliana's train wreck and my train wreck is that after the band stopped playing, they didn't have to play Uptown Funk. 
I did. That's the real tragedy.